Good morning, everyone, and welcome to this morning service. It's good to be back again with you. And just as we're settling down to worship, um, to learn from God's word and to talk things through with him, I was just thinking how wonderful it is that we're just a small group, um, but we're joining with thousands and millions and millions of other people throughout the world in this time to give our praise, to talk out our concerns with God, the Father, our Father, Almighty. And yet, of course, the beauty of God is that not only is he the God of the whole universe, but he knows us all so individually and he is aware of our own individual needs, our own individual hopes, our own individual fears and frustrations, and he cares about them all and is able to be with us all through the power of his Holy Spirit, who brings us comfort, um, wisdom, encouragement and just God's wonderful presence in what can be really quite an overwhelming period at the moment. So it's good to remember that God is with us and through him and through his Holy Spirit, we are joining with the fellowship of all believers throughout the world. My mum used to love the Psalms. She used to say that they expressed all human thought and emotion as the writers were talking things through with God. And as we've been watching Spring Harvest um, a little bit this week, I suddenly thought that's the Psalm that uh, is needed to be used as a prayer, an opening prayer for this morning service. So I'm going to read parts of Psalm 57 and then as we finish that as a prayer, if we can say the Lord's Prayer all together in our individual places of worship this morning. So shall we pray using Psalm 57? It's actually a Psalm of David. Have mercy on us, O God, have mercy. We look to you for protection. We will hide beneath the shadow of your wings until this violent storm is past. We cry out to God most high, to God who will fulfil his purpose for us. He will send help from heaven to save us, rescuing us from those who are out to get us. Our God will send forth his unfailing love and faithfulness. Lord, my heart is confident in you. No wonder we can sing your praises. So wake up, my soul, wake up, O harp and lyre. We will waken the dawn with song. We will thank you, Lord, in front of all the people. We will sing your praises among the nations because your unfailing love is as high as the heavens and your faithfulness reaches to the clouds. Be exalted, O God, above the highest heavens and may your glory shine over all the earth. Amen. Morning everyone, Alison here. Today's reading is taken from Acts chapter 2, verse 14a, and then going on from verses 22 to 32. Then Peter stood up with the eleven, raised his voice, and addressed the crowd. Men of Israel, listen to this. Jesus of Nazareth was a man accredited by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs, which God did among you through him, as you yourselves know. This man was handed over to you by God's set purpose and foreknowledge, and you, with the help of wicked men, put him to death by nailing him to the cross. But God raised him from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death, because it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. David said about him, I saw the Lord always before me, 
because he is at my right hand, I will not be shaken. Therefore, my heart is glad and my tongue rejoices. My body also will live in hope because you will not abandon me to the grave, nor will you let your Holy One see decay. You have made known to me the paths of life. You will fill me with joy in your presence. Brothers, I can tell you confidently that the patriarch David died and was buried, and his tomb is here to this day. But he was a prophet and knew that God had promised him on oath that he would place one of his descendants on his throne. Seeing what was ahead, he spoke of the resurrection of the Christ, that he was not abandoned to the grave, nor did his body see decay. God has raised this Jesus to life, and we are all witnesses of the fact. Lord's Prayer Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom, the power and the glory, now and forever. Amen. Hello everybody, welcome to the kids part of the service. And today we are going to be doing how God forgives us when we do wrong. So we are going to make stains on these pieces of cloth and we are then going to use the stain remover to represent God forgiving us. So first we've got ketchup. I'm actually going to make the stains. Yeah. Ketchup here. Now. Yeah. So we've got ketchup here and what am I meant to do after I've done the stain? Just make the stains on each of the three pieces of cloth. Okay, make the stains on each, do I do all three? Yep. Yeah. On each three pieces of cloth for your ketchup. And then next we've got, um, we've got mud, so do the same that you did with the ketchup. If you don't have ketchup or you don't want mud in your house, you could choose something else to make your stains. Why would they have mud in the house? <clears throat> and now finally we've got coffee. So we'll put it on. Once you've done all your stains, it's time to use the stain remover. So over here we're going to have all of our stain removers. And the first one is going to be washing up liquid. And then we're going to have vinegar. at home and then there's lots of other ways that you can do this. And finally we're going to have bicarbonate of soda. If I can open it. So 
if you don't have these ingredients at home you could use other things like lemon juice or like um, clothes washing powder oh look at these dirty stains we need to get them washed with our solutions so that we made earlier so let's start with the ketchup so we'll grab one I'll, I'm going to do the washing up liquid and I'm doing the bicarbonate of soda Have the stains come out? Oh, this one's partly come out. Yep. Right. And this one is the vinegar. So now we're on to the mud and I'm going to wash this one with the washing up liquid and I'm doing the bicarb. Are they coming out? Yep, this one's not really coming out. Oh, very good, Emily. Yours worked well. Oh dear. So I'm gonna go to do the vinegar now. How's that one looking? Kind of coming out. Let's see. Hmm. Still a bit stained. Now this is our third and final what, experiment with the coffee. So let's start. I'm doing the washing up liquid and I'm doing the bicarbonate of soda. That one looks like a very stubborn stain, girls. Yeah. Is it coming out? Kind of. Sort of. Let's have a look then. Oh, mmm. It's faded a bit. Very much. So you can try the same experiment at home as well. Okay, so what was the point of all that stain removing, you might well ask? Well, let's go back a bit to when Adam and Eve were in the Garden of Eden. God had made them perfect. They had pure, clean hearts, just like this piece of cloth here, just like the pieces of cloth that we did our experiment on. And because they had clean, pure hearts, they could be God's friends. They could walk with him in the garden, they could talk with him, they could play with him, they could call out to him and he would come and see them. But then they made a decision. They decided to disobey God. And that disobedience was called sin. So, Emily, could you make that heart into a, a dirty heart now, please? Can you think of th some things that God wouldn't like? Some things that um, would be disobeying God? Hurting each other. Yeah. Okay. So... That clean, pure heart that God had created, it was no longer clean and pure. And that meant that Adam and Eve couldn't be God's friends anymore. 
<sighs> they couldn't find a way back to God. God needed to find a way back to them. And that's why he sent Jesus. Jesus was our way back to God. Just listen to this little bit of um, a reading. The Bible says that sin is in charge of us. We're its slaves. Sin is keeping us from being all we could be in every area of our lives. It's robbed us of our freedom and our hearts are in chains. How do slaves get free? Someone has to redeem them. They pay the price to buy them back out of slavery and set them free. The Bible says that Jesus redeemed us out of slavery to sin. How did he do that? He paid the price to get us back. And what was that price? It was his life. When Jesus died for us, he made us clean. I'm hoping this will work. This is my ultimate stain remover. I'll give it a little swish. And our hearts were once again clean. And that meant that we could talk to God, we could walk with him again. That meant that we could be God's friend again. Thanks for listening. Look at my sparkly clean line of washing. Oh look, it's our memory verse for today. Let's say it together. If we confess our sins to him, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. 1 John chapter 1 verse 9. Oh no, I accidentally on purpose made this one fly away. Let's see if we can remember it. If we confess our sins to him, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. 1 John chapter 1 verse 9. Oh no, I accidentally made this fall off. Let's say it together again. If we confess our sins to him, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. 1 John chapter 1 verse 9. Oh no, I accidentally on purpose made this one fall away. Let's say it one more time. If we confess our sins to him, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. 1 John chapter 1 verse 9. Oh no, this one accidentally on purposely fell off. Let's say it for the last time now. If we confess our sins to him, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. 1 John chapter 1 verse 9. Well done everybody, that was really hard. Even I found it tricky. Bye. Morning everybody and uh, welcome to the sermon which is based on Acts chapter 2. It's the set theme for the day and um, I want to begin by asking a question and the question is do you like to be in control or do you prefer God to be in control or do you like a bit of both? 
and uh, we certainly are living at the moment in a world which is a little bit, it seems to be a little bit out of control. Um, I was thinking about something I heard about recently using the analogy of an airliner. Um, it's cruised for thousands of miles on autopilot, but suddenly an emergency happens and the pilot has to take manual control and the uh, crew and the passengers all have to put the trust in him and hope he can bring the thing down safely. And it made me think back to an incident that happened in January 2009, you may remember it, when uh, an American Airbus took off from one of the New York airports and uh, it had only got into the air for a few minutes when it collided with a flock of Canada geese and they knocked out both engines and it was sort of in glide and the well if they'd continued in autopilot they'd have just been a complete disaster so they had to switch from autopilot to being in uh, with the pilot being in control and he glided it down and eventually they landed on the Hudson River and uh, remarkably without any loss of life and with very little uh, in the way of serious injury uh, but it was because of the uh, I suppose the skill of the pilot the fact that he, he'd been doing it for a, a lot of years uh, it was quite a senior chap and um, he uh, was a very wise man, a uh, very knowledgeable man and uh, yeah in his hands he was able to bring it down with no loss of life and they called it the miracle on the, the Hudson and uh, that took place in 2009 and in a way um, you could say that looking at it from a world point of view we've been cruising along on secular self-sufficient uh, unbelieving autopilot and suddenly um, we need God. Um, people who don't believe in God are finding themselves praying. Uh, according to a study that uh, the University of Copenhagen have done recently, uh, they've discovered that Google searches for prayer, the word prayer, are having the same exponential rise as the virus, doubling uh, with every 80,000 new cases. It was also interesting a couple of weeks ago um, when Boris Johnson went into hospital and the unlikely hashtag pray for Boris uh, took off. Uh, so it wasn't, you know, think nice thoughts about Boris, but actually pray for Boris. There was another article I was reading in the Washington Examiner, which somebody uh, forwarded to me. That's an American newspaper but it was actually about something that happened in England well around about the time of uh, Boris going into hospital because it was a recorded prayer by a high church clergyman with as the Washington examiner put it a rich chocolate cake voice and uh, it was actually a lovely prayer but quite an old-fashioned one in many ways the prayer was accept we beseech thee the supplications of thy servants who call upon thee in their time of trouble. We pray to thee on behalf of our Prime Minister Boris Johnson, restore him to his former health and prolong his days on earth. And apparently it went viral. So it's an unusual situation where we're out of control or feel as if we're out of control, but amazing things are happening. And turning to the Bible passage, Peter and the disciples felt equally out of control and scared by the death of Jesus uh, and their world was falling apart. So it, it's not a, a sort of phenomenon that we're experiencing today that hasn't been felt before. Uh, Peter was completely thrown um, when he was in the courtyard of the high priest when just a servant girl uh, accosted him about whether he belonged to Jesus and he denied Jesus it turned out three times after that and um, if you think about it the disciples for several weeks afterwards they kept on having these um, post-resurrection appearances of Jesus which was absolutely marvellous but they were a bit like ourselves living in lockdown uh, it says that they were living they were hiding behind locked doors for fear of the Jewish leaders the question is 
what transformed them. And that's what we're looking at in this passage from Acts chapter 2. And the answer is that it was the baptism of the Holy Spirit, which immediately precedes the set passage for today, which is, in fact, God taking control. So it was the same Peter, um, but he was a changed man. Instead of being scared and hiding behind locked doors, he was bold and courageous and he was absolutely overflowing with the Holy Spirit. And uh, the passage we're looking at uh, is this amazing sermon that uh, Peter preached, which I think actually was the first Christian sermon recorded. It was extremely evangelistic. John Wesley would have loved it. And its focus was entirely on the absolute essence of the gospel, which is namely that Jesus died and um, he rose from the dead. He was raised physically uh, to prove his power over death. And it happened for all time and for all people, for anybody who puts their trust in him. So when at Joyce Kennywell's funeral, a couple of, uh, well, last month, wasn't it? Um, there were only a few of us there, but when David uh, and Pam processed down the aisle, uh, reciting the words from John 11, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even though he dies. And whoever believes in me will never die. They were stating, again, the absolute fundamentals of the Christian gospel. And applying it, of course, to Joyce's life, uh, the fact that she did trust in the Lord means without doubt that she is in heaven with him now. Uh, and that's interesting. It's good to know that as the world is gripped by the fear of the coronavirus, we're constantly reminded how important it is that in this life and even in death, um, that we, we can't rely on anything apart from Jesus himself on Christ the solid rock I stand, all of the ground is sinking sand. So we've got all sorts of things to help us. We're thankful for the gifts that God has given us, medicine, science, all those sorts of things. But that's what they are. They're not gods in themselves. They are gifts and we're thankful for them. So we continue with the passage and Peter proceeds to set out the evidence that Jesus is both Lord and Christ. That's verse 36. So in other words, he's Christ because he is the anointed one, the one who was uh, predicted, uh, foretold that he would be the saviour of the Jewish nation and indeed the whole world. But he's also Lord insofar as um, we owe him our allegiance. And so the um, passage that we're looking at breaks down into three different sections. First of all, verses 22 to 24, where Peter gives a, a brief summary of the life, death and resurrection of Jesus. And then verses 25 to 31, where he says it is a fulfillment of Old Testament prophecy. And then finally, in verse 32, Peter restates the fact of the resurrection and he says, we are witnesses of it. So if we just have a look at those in turn, first of all, at the first section from verse 22, where Peter says, men of Israel, this Jesus of Nazareth was a man accredited by God to you by miracles, wonders and signs, which God did among you through him, as you yourselves know. And of course, they did know the general population of the whole area would know all about the things that Jesus did. It wasn't just in Jerusalem, the capital. A lot of Jesus's miracles in the early part of his uh, ministry were performed in Galilee around Capernaum. And then uh, in Samaria, the incident of the woman at the well in John chapter four was in Samaria. Uh, and also in some of the neighbouring Gentile districts, if you think about it, some of the miracles were performed in the Decapolis, the area of the Ten Towns, which was a Gentile district. The, um, the healing of the Canaanite woman's daughter, uh, that was performed probably in the sort of Sidon region uh, to the north of, uh, of, of, the, of, of, um, 
of Judea and Israel. So it, uh, it comprised of all sorts of um, signs and wonders, miracles, uh, healings of people who were deaf, people who were blind, people with leprosy, uh, epileptics, casting out of demons, um, people who were paralysed, um, people even raised from the dead. There's the instance of uh, the raising of Lazarus and the healing of uh, Jairus's daughter, things like that. So there's no doubt that during Jesus's life, people had evidence of his uh, the fact that he's a very special person and uh, we're looking a few weeks ago at uh, John chapter 3 Nicodemus coming to Jesus by night and you remember Nicodemus he was of the Jewish ruling council and uh, this is what he said to him which again acknowledges the fact that they knew who Jesus was Rabbi we know you are a teacher who has come from God for no one could perform the miraculous signs you were doing if God were not with him so they know what they're doing and Peter is polite and is respectful. He calls them fellow Jews, fellow Israelites, but he's also very direct. Uh, they were complicit in the crucifixion. They killed Jesus. Um, but although they may have thought they were in control, in actual fact they weren't because God raised Jesus from the dead and actually, it was all part of God's plan as evidenced in Old Testament scriptures, which Peter then goes on to prove. So we've had Jesus's life, his death, his resurrection. And now Peter goes on to say this was all planned. And um, the next section we'll look at is verses 25 to 31. Peter goes on to show how Old Testament prophecy by King David in Psalm 16 is fulfilled in Jesus's resurrection. He says David can't have been talking about himself when he said to God, you will not abandon me to the grave, nor will you let your Holy One see decay. That's in verse 27 of Acts 2, um, but obviously it's also in uh, in Psalm, in the latter part of Psalm 16. And the reason for, for that is because plainly King David did die, his body did corrupt and decay, and Peter could have taken taken them to the very place in, um, in Judea, probably in Jerusalem, where David was buried. So if that's the case, David must have been speaking prophetically about the Messiah, who other prophecy is mentioned in Isaiah um, 11 and Jeremiah 23, I think also in part of uh, 2 Samuel, there are prophecies about um, the fact that the Messiah would be uh, one of David's descendants. So Peter starts where the people are, is actually preaching to a whole pile of people in Jerusalem, not just Jews, although probably predominantly Jews, but people from all nations. We know that from the fact that people heard them speaking in other tongues. Uh, in the beginning of the sermon, he goes on to talk about the prophecy from Joel that predicted that that would be the case. But um, as far as the Jewish listeners are concerned, Peter, in using Old Testament prophecy, they would be fairly well versed in that and they would know what he was talking about. So that's what he does. And he does it at exactly the right time when they're ready to hear it. You may remember... I think three or four weeks ago, David preached a sermon on the Transfiguration. How Jesus appeared in his glory with Moses, the great lawgiver, and Elijah, the great prophet. And after the apostles have seen um, Jesus in his glory, they then go back down the mountain. And I imagine Peter's dying to tell people what they've seen. But Jesus says to him in Matthew 17, verse 9, um, don't tell anyone what you've seen until the Son of Man, which is a phrase, of course, that Jesus frequently used of himself, until the Son of Man has been raised from the dead. Now, obviously, at that time, Jesus uh, was still alive, hadn't been killed and hadn't been raised from the dead, but now he has. And so the timing of Peter addressing this great gathering of several thousand people in Jerusalem is the right time. They're ready to hear it, they're ready to listen, and it's God's timing. 
And it struck me that that's quite an important message for us as well, that the timing has to be right, often uh, with ourselves. I know for myself that um, I regularly pray for friends and family and work colleagues uh, to whom I'd love to be able to tell them something about my own testimony of, of what Jesus means to me and uh, what he's done in my life. Um, and I have to say that I pray for openings and nothing seems to happen. And uh, sometimes it seems that they're as close to the gospel as ever. And yet uh, we do pray in faith that God's timing is perfect. It's different to ours. It says somewhere in Isaiah that um, my thoughts are not your thoughts and uh, my, 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 thought, my ways are not yours. And that's, that's, I'm sure that is the case, that God knows the right timing for all these people in our own families and friendship groups that we'd love to um, reach out to. But maybe it's not always the time to do it verbally. And we just have to, well, to live our lives as faithfully as we can as a living demonstration of faith in action. And at just the right time, the Lord will make it happen as he did here in Acts. And I think that in these days of fear and uncertainty that we're living through at the moment with coronavirus and so on, um, God is creating opportunities for witness in ways that nobody expected. Um, for example, the church ladies group, the WhatsApp group that you've set up, uh, I think has been amazing. There have been so many testimonies that have come around and I've read them and I've been quite inspired myself. Um, People um, have sent round prayers. We've had pictures of flower bedecked crosses in people's gardens, um, which, of course, are a witness for people walking past on a public footpath or just walking down the road. So there are ways in which we can witness, even though we can't um, all the time be able to witness verbally. God will create opportunities when the time is right for those things to happen. We've had stories of answered prayer. There was the story of the, um, well, this was something that was on, on YouTube and on, in the news about the uh, Italian priest who uh, declined a ventilator so that younger people or children would be able to have it. And he, he insisted on um, ministering to his flock and ended up at the end of it, he, he died, which was really sad. But it's been one of those things that's been a practical outworking of God's um, witness and, and well, his witness uh, through his own life of what Christ means to him um, without necessarily having to say a single word. I mean, that's a very extreme example, but it's a wonderful one. And it's, if you like, a kind of reflection of what Jesus has done for us. He died on the cross for us and um, that man was doing what Jesus did. So all these things have been coming round and uh, new opportunities through this awful um, coronavirus situation. We do pray for the days to be foreshortened and that the Lord will uh, ultimately take it away. But we do place our trust in him. So then finally, at the end of this amazing sermon of Peter's, um, we're told that many people come to their senses and they ask. This actually isn't in the immediate text that we're looking at but it's worth mentioning anyway verse 37 people ask they're cut to the heart and they say brothers what can we do to which peter replied repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of jesus christ for the forgiveness of your sins that's verse 38 and uh, we know that many did repent and it says um in the passage i think it's verse 41 that about three thousand People were added to their number that day. That would be a marvellous thing if it happened in Scarborough. But God's timing was absolutely right. And then we come to Peter's final point, And it's a restatement of the resurrection in verse 32, without which our faith, Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, if the resurrection didn't happen, then our faith's a complete waste of time. And we of all people are to be pitied the most, but praise the Lord, it did. And Peter states this, God raised this Jesus to life and we're all witnesses of that fact. And the final point I want to mention really is just reflecting on that, the fact that we are witnesses. And the 
fact that the resurrection of Jesus from the dead is not a theory. It says in the passage, uh, we are witnesses of the fact. So it's a fact that many people have set out to disprove. There was a man called Frank Morrison, who in 1930 wrote a book called Who Moved the Stone? And he was uh, an advertising uh, journalist and he, he had all the investigative sk skills to look into it and uh, did so. But the more he looked into it, the more he found that the facts bore up and he became convinced that the resurrection did take place. And the book that he wrote was completely different to the book he'd expected to write. And I guess in our own time, uh, more recently at any rate, um, Lee Strobel and uh, The Case for Christ. It was a book, first of all, it's been made into a film, a film that was shown at Berniston Chapel on at least one occasion. And it's the story of how annoyed he was when his wife became a Christian because he was an atheist. And um, he set out to disprove it and in due course ended up considering all the evidence and having to decide uh, rather like C.S. Lewis in 1929 when he said I decided that God was God and that it was all true and he became what he described as the most reluctant convert in all England and here we have Lee Strobel the same he just couldn't argue with the facts and he ended up becoming a Christian himself and has been the most amazing pastor of a church over in America written lots of books and been on the international speaking circuit. So there it is. Um, we can witness in so many ways, but we need to take hold of the fact that it is a fact, it's not a theory. And um, we are witnesses to it. And just turning back to, to our old friend Joyce, um, she she knew the gospel that uh, anybody who repents of the sins and puts the trust in Jesus um, can completely know without doubt that they have eternal life. And uh, I know that Joyce longed to tell people, friends who weren't Christians and people in her own family, um, her story of how she became a Christian and what the Lord meant to her. And uh, of course, in the end, she was given the opportunity to write those two booklets. And um, I hope they'll come up on the screen, Up the Mountain, the, book, the story of how she came through to faith. And it took about 25 years, I think. And then Mountain of Delights, a bit about her life as a Christian. So she wasn't able to witness using the spoken word, but she was able to witness using the written word. And of course, it's a remarkable testimony. Do read the books to find out her story. Um, but God, uh, in a way, well, did direct her to, uh, to, to write down the second book, which she thought she'd never be able to do. She thought she wouldn't have the strength to write uh, Mountain of Delights. But God gave her that period of a time when she was able to witness to his faithfulness to her and uh, how he was the one in which she was able to repose trust, uh, knowing that he was the only person who'd ever conquered death itself. So Peter and the disciples, they were witnesses of the fact. Uh, Joyce is uh, a witness of the fact in her booklets, and we ourselves are also witnesses of the fact in our own lives. And I guess one day we may be given the chance to write down our story. Hopefully we'll be given the chance to um, to tell people from time to time. If you do get the chance to witness verbally for the Lord, grasp it with both hands. It's always good to be able to use personal testimony, what the Lord has done in our lives, to, um, to, to speak out the gospel. Um, but even when we can't do that, just to remember that God's timing is perfect. And in the meantime, just to keep on living out our life of faith as a living testimony of what we know to be true. Um, and that in uncertain times, which we certainly are in at the moment, we do have a saviour on whom we can rely with absolute certainty, who holds each one of us in the hollow of his hand. Good morning everybody and welcome to this part of the service. 
where we're going to offer some prayers and intercessions. I did speak to Paul about what he was preaching on in Acts 2 and it tied in with what I felt the Lord was saying to me. I was given the, I've been given the word fortitude and I know from some preaching that I've listened to before that the Holy Spirit is our comforter. This part, the core part of the word fort means to strengthen and equip and help us stand upright. It was, it was that preaching that I understood and the what Paul has preached about is the fact that it's the first gospel message that Peter boldly came to preach. And in that preaching, part of it was receiving the Holy Spirit, which Peter himself had received and made him a different man to the one who rejected Jesus just before the crucifixion. And we as Christians can believe and take hold of that fortitude. We can take hold of understanding that the Holy Spirit is with us, comforting and equipping us. I feel as well that we've all been in totally unique situations in the last three weeks. For some of us, there's been blessings. For some of us, there's been struggles. I would imagine there's probably been blessings and struggles for all of us, but in different degrees and in different ways. I can definitely say the last three weeks for me has been quite a struggle, physically, emotionally, socially, morally. There's been so many different things, but it is the Lord that brings us out of that and the Lord that strengthens and equips us. So how I want to pray today is to pray for ourselves first and then have that quiet time where we can bring any of our unique situations to the Lord and ask him to strengthen, equip us and give us the Holy Spirit in a, in a fresh outpouring. And then we will pray for those around us and situations that are on our heart um, where we need God's divine intervention or just God's blessing, God's comfort, God's touch. Also, I've got some scriptures. I want to start off sharing the scripture that I received this morning, which really has helped me. And so I'll start our prayers off with that. And it says here, I will be glad and rejoice in your love, for you saw my affliction and knew the anguish of my soul. You have not given me into the hands of the enemy, but you have set my feet in a spacious place. And that's from Psalm 31, verse 7. So I want to pray us to be in that spacious place. If we're not there already, whatever we are in whatever anguish or affliction that we have if we have that then the Lord can bring us into into that spacious place so let's just pray together and um, receive from the Lord Heavenly Father we thank you that you are our Abba Father we thank you that you love us so much that you have sent Jesus to be here with us in spirit and in truth. Thank you, Jesus, that through the Holy Spirit we receive your truth, your love and your comfort. We acknowledge you as our High Priest, Jesus. We acknowledge you as our Healer. We acknowledge you as our Saviour. We acknowledge you as our Friend and our Deliverer. And Lord, we are all in unique situations, new and demanding situations that many of us find a great challenge. But we know with you as our comforter that all will be well. So anything that we're struggling with now, anything that we want to bring before you in our own personal life, in our own heart, our spirit, our soul, we just bring to you now and ask for you to bring us into that spacious place. We thank you, Lord, that we know that in all things you work for the good, for good, for those who love you, who've been called according to your purpose. And we believe as followers of Jesus that we are in that divine and unique place where you will work things out for good. 
we also know, Lord, that you are with us all the time. And we just acknowledge that now. And if there's any blockage, anything there that's not allowing us to be in your presence, may you, by your Holy Spirit, re keep revealing that to us. And keep helping us grow in truth and in spirit. Thank you, Lord. Thank you that we can receive the fortitude that we need. And now, Lord, we want to pray for other people. And we're going to, I'm going to declare, Lord, that you are in our midst. You are mighty to save. You rejoice over us with gladness. You quiet, quieten, us, quieten us with your love. And you rejoice over us with singing. And in that stance, we can stand in the authority of Jesus' name and pray for other people and other situations. Lord, there is so much need for prayer around us. We thank you and praise you and pray for our NHS and all the doctors and nurses, cleaners, cooks, admin workers, porters, everybody who's working and dealing with all the changes and stresses and straining, our prayers are with them. Lord, provide comfort for them. Lord, we pray for all the people who are still working, key workers who are out and about in society working. We pray for your comfort and your wisdom, your revelation, everything for them. We pray for people working at home. We pray for people at home on their own. We pray for children and families. And we stand for your goodness, your faithfulness, your kindness in all these situations. Lord, we lift up the world to you and how it's dealing with everything that's going on around. We pray for our leaders. We pray for wisdom for them. And we pray that this time will make a difference. And Lord, in this quiet now, we bring all those things that burden our hearts for others to your throne of grace, Jesus. You are our high priest. And we bring these prayers to you now. Yes, Lord, we do thank you now that we have all authority and power because you, Jesus, give that to us. We have authority and power over snakes and scorpions and know that all power of the enemy. And I'd like to pray us to have our spiritual armour on. Um, in our Bible group, Julie White, a few years ago, was given a picture of Christians standing together with their battle armour. And I want to share that with you now. It's because we put our belt of truth on. We put our breastplate of righteousness on. We put our shoes of the gospel of peace because we are called by the Lord to be peacemakers. But then we lift our shield of faith up and those big Roman shields that are huge, right? Rectangular affairs that can be linked together and put side by side. Um, in the testudo formation, but we won't go into that now. They're put together. And so these prayers are mighty because we pray together as an army of Christians, side by side, because when two or more are gathered in your name, Jesus, you're in our midst. That's the difference that prayer makes in these situations. So we are lifting up our shields of faith and we're standing firm in the faith. Standing firm in the faith. And we put on our helmets of salvation and we lift up the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. And we finish by praying, Lord, put your words into our lips and mouths this week as we go out. Um, give us that, that the power and the fortitude that comes from your Holy Spirit, but comes from your word as well, as we go out into this fresh week in our unique circumstances that you know. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord shine his face upon you and give you his grace and favour. And may the Lord lift his countenance to you and give you his peace. In the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Amen.